It might seem quaint to generations centuries from now that people of this time called games from only 15, 20, 30, 40 years past old, classic, or retro. These are still the early days for electronic gaming as a medium for art and entertainment. To fully convey the context of the first decades of video games, historians already face challenges such as the reduced availability of print media. Engineers and self-educated enthusiasts in the gaming community have studied, documented, and replicated the behavior of many game systems. But are these implementations accurate? And how will this information be carried into the future? It's impossible to guess if many people in the 22nd century and beyond will even want to play or research the games that people today consider to be historically significant or all-time classics. But it's up to those who can preserve all of this. Those with the knowledge, experience, interest, and access to the games and hardware to ensure that it will be possible to do so. Whether for fun, money, certain noble ideals, or just a nostalgia fix. Community members, organizations, and companies have dedicated significant effort to keeping older games and systems alive in the present and pushing them toward the future in their own ways, going beyond the original hardware. Evan Amos is a collector. The closets and hallways of his New York apartment are filled with shelf after shelf of game systems and vintage computers. This is the Magnavox Odyssey. It is the very first video game console ever released. It plays games, question mark, air quotes. You can see it's like board game pieces. It's got cling things that you'd stick onto the TV. And the way that the system worked is that it came with jumper cards. There's no memory on these. These are just physical rewirers that you would stick into the system and it would rewire the system to come up with different rules for different games. This is a bit taken apart, but this is one of my favorite consoles in terms of design because it's so weird and we don't have systems that came out since then that are like this. Many of Evan's systems are common, others very rare, obscure, and expensive. But this collection is not for himself. I don't really get an enjoyment from owning these things, particularly. I have a weird relationship with this stuff. Um, when I would buy stuff, I would look for stuff that's in good cosmetic quality, but I don't care if it works. Evan has dedicated himself as the creator and curator of a freely available, freely usable digital photo archive the Van Amo Online Game Museum of the Wikimedia Commons. The way that the whole project started was I was just looking at like Wikipedia one day and I was just like, oh my God, these pictures are terrible. It would be like some guy took like a really early digital camera, like a little Canon point and shoot, and he just shot something that was like on his carpet. And there'd be like a beer can in the background or something. You know what I mean? It was just like very sloppy, very messy. Up to that point, Evan had mostly been interested in portrait photography. So product photography was a new challenge. I shoot a very specific style for my photos, which I consider very neutral. Nothing really editorialized, flat lighting. I just want people to be able to see the thing very clearly. Because I mean, it's, this is essentially for an encyclopedia. It should be neutral, no big flair. But shooting his own game consoles would only get him so far. Who the hell do I know owns a 64DD? No one. And I was really lucky at that point, um, I met this collector guy and like at the office at his work, he had a giant wall of all these like systems in box that he'd been collecting over the years. And he had like amazing rare stuff like Casio Loopy, the 64DD, the Commodore 64 game system, like super rare stuff. I took all my stuff there, got on subway, 
set up at his office at work for like two days. Evan had built up an impressive library of photos, but his equipment, technique, and editing skills improved over the years. The way that I do it now is that I shoot on glass because I don't want any shadows. To me, an important aspect of the photos is that people can reuse them, which means that they can easily cut them out and isolate them. And you can't really do that if you have the shadow on the bottom. At first, Evan had no idea the impact his project would have on the public's access to images and information about video game consoles. I was thinking about Wikipedia. I was just thinking about myself. I was just like, my own little checklist. I want to fix up these 20 pages. And then over time, I noticed that the photos that I had taken were appearing in articles. They were appearing in YouTube videos. Nintendo tape plus Nintendo Entertainment System equals games in a minute. They were appearing in magazines, news segments on TV. I have a shirt, an Atari shirt, where they just traced my photo of the Atari 2600 and it was, I bought it at Target. And it just kind of blew my mind. And at this point, you know, it's gone from something that I've been doing for myself to realizing this is a service that I'm doing for the community because I pretty much can see the reach and I really just kept wanting to do more, but I was just running into the limitation of not having the objects, being stuck with what photos I had. Evan decided that in order to keep the quality and consistency of the photos up to its standards, to have time to shoot and reshoot the devices and associated accessories in a controlled environment from as many angles as possible, including the insides, he would need a new approach. Hi, I'm Evan Amos and I'm a photographer. With your help, I'd like to create an online museum dedicated to preserving the history of video games. In 2013, Evan went to Kickstarter with hopes of bringing his work to the next level. Following a slow start, Evan was offered the opportunity to rally people to his cause on Gama Sutra, which led to an explosion of support, with funding ending at over $17,000, double his $8,500 goal. Everything that I was getting money-wise for Kickstarter, it was just directly buying something. I'm not paying myself, I'm not paying for equipment. I just want to buy this stuff so I can photograph it, so I can create free archives of photos for everyone to have. The Kickstarter buzz also led to a publishing deal. Evan released a hardcover book titled The Game Console in 2018. When I started this whole project, I was just some guy taking photos. And over time, it just became like I'm an actual historian because not only am I finding out all these consoles, like I have to read about them, I have to learn their history. Evan Amos's work is almost certainly the most accessible, most viewed, most widely used and reused work of preservation in the video game realm. Few will ever play or see an Amstrad GX 4000 in person, but visitors to the Van Amo Online Game Museum can see what the system and its controllers look like what video connections it has, what kind of memory, processing chips, and other components are integrated onto its motherboard, and even what its power supply looks like. A version with a transparent background allows anyone to manipulate the highest quality image of the Amstrad GX 4000 that has ever existed for any purpose they please. I've had my photos be used by YouTubers and stuff like that, That's, I can expect that but I've also had my photos be used by the companies themselves. I've had my photos used by Sony professionally. I've had photos be used by Microsoft, Nintendo. Where's Rob? Rob, the robot behind me. What a crazy <laughs> idea that this system had a robot that came with it. <laughs> I'm not kidding when I'm saying like the impact of these photos is more than just like a little thing. They get used for everything. They get used for the default. Evan's continued contributions to the public domain may be the ultimate visual references of these consoles for all time. Images that convey certain aspects of what the originals are like. But photos are only one piece of the preservation puzzle. For people to have a complete experience with games and hardware that they don't have direct access to, to experience those games in a way that could be accurate, game data must be copied and system behavior replicated. Outsiders might think that classic game is all about old things. 
But to those of us who are really here at the bleeding edge, it seems like this stuff is really using cutting edge technology, you know, to interface with our new TVs, the higher resolutions and things like that. Smoke Monster is a content creator and open source community contributor with a master's degree in anthropology and archaeology who champions emerging technologies that offer promising potential for video game preservation and accessibility. Hey, it's Smoke Monster, and today I'm showing off possibly my favorite Mr. Feature of them all. This is a brand new feature uh, made by Risha, which allows you to add USB hard drive storage to your setup seamlessly and easily. Smoke Monster is most well known for his work in organizing ROM dumps and ROM hacks that are confirmed to be playable on original hardware through flash cartridges or with various forms of hardware emulation, which have resulted in the open source Smoke Monster pack lists. The open source projects allows me to basically describe a ROM setup via a script that people can use to then set up their ROMs on their side using their own ROM collection. It's a legal way to share information about ideal ROM setups and tools for organizing them, leaving it up to the end user to decide how the actual ROM files should be obtained. But the unauthorized copying and distribution of game software is one of the most divisive subjects in the community. Copyright law has mutated a lot over the past century. So instead of being like 20 years of protection, it's 90 years or 150 or something now. I can't even remember how high it's gone. But, you know, that's, that's not the intent of copyright law. That was not how it was supposed to work. For some, it is a totally black and white issue. There is no situation where it would be appropriate to use a copy of software that was not purchased or otherwise legally obtained. Many categorize piracy as a gray area. Is the software still being sold? Is it extremely rare or expensive? And who benefits from the sale? Others ridicule collecting as nothing more than a vain pursuit or argue that a pirated game is a sale that was never going to happen in the first place. Due to lax enforcement, piracy has become normalized and even glamorized as noble. Piracy is a weird term. I mean, I, I think that piracy kind of originally started with the old people that were selling VCDs on the street in Japan and stuff like that. And there was this whole thought that people make money on piracy, whereas the old retro game community isn't really about making money on games. It's more about, I can't find Earthbound. I don't want to spend X number of dollars for a crazy game that I'm not sure if I even like. Now, maybe if I could go rent it, I would, but you, you can't. You know, I'm, I'm okay occasionally downloading ROMs of games that would be impossibly expensive to play otherwise. Like, who's, who's hurting with that? No one. I used to always be against Steam because in the back of my head, it's like, you don't have like a physical release of something. The downside to that is you're kind of giving up your control over it, right? I see this being a potential problem in the future and it doesn't finally hit until like something gets dropped from like the Xbox Live Arcade store, like that Turtles game. If you look at the Wii Virtual Console, for example, all of that, that system has now been shut down. What happens to all that software if, if, if you format or if it goes away? The PlayStation 3, it's certainly aging too, and there's a lot of excellent uh, download-only pay software for the PS3. What happens to it if Sony shuts those servers down? I mean, I think there is certainly a point to where piracy in some respects is absolutely merited. I'm very scrupulous about not pirating anything that I could go out and buy new at like Walmart or Target or something. Like, please support publishers and developers who are creating video games. They are what keep the industry alive and they need to be able to eat. Otherwise, we will not have video games. At the same time, if something is out of print, out of circulation, go download that copy of Little Samson instead of paying some retailer at a classic games convention 2,000 bucks for it because it's a good game, but not that good. And the original creators are not seeing a penny of that $2,000. There probably is a line, and I don't know if it's in the same spot all the time. It might be moving. My personal line, and the reason that I am completely comfortable having every ROM for every game system ever sitting on a hard drive over there, is that if a game is available to purchase right now from uh, on a newer console, I will always buy it. 
And uh, while legally that's still wrong, I still shouldn't download the ROM of Sonic even though I have the cartridge, I don't care at all because I know I'm still supporting the people that are trying to make a living off of it. When classic game compilations come out or classic game reissues are, are made available, it's good to invest in those because you are investing in keeping classic gaming viable to make that a business that can be developed and expanded and continue to thrive. You know, like if, if people are not making money doing that, like that entire segment of the games industry will go away. I mean, I personally, I, I don't like using things that I don't have ownership of. It's just how I feel, but I don't like forcing that on other people. The action of putting the cartridge in makes the game feel more valuable because you're not just picking from a list. You're not gonna spend the time that you would if you got like a new game for like Christmas, right? And you're gonna play every angle of that game versus, oh, I died, okay, now to the next game. Somebody bragging about I have 15,000 ROMs, that's meaningless, but somebody saying I have 50 carts, that's pretty good. ROMs have become so synonymous with download copies of games that many people may not even know that the term comes from the physical ROM or read-only memory inside game cartridges and on arcade boards. While ROMs are often hidden in the deep recesses of the internet, those dumps preserve a wide range of games, from common retail releases to prototypes, regional variants, and games that may have only been released through unconventional means, such as with satellite services or as contest prizes. There are commercial films that only exist as commercial films because someone stole reels. I think in any field, including video games, that, you know, most of most of history gets saved because people, you know, skirt the law. They, they steal from work, they, they donate things they don't own the intellectual property to, to libraries and archives and things like that. And that's, that's just how it's done. There's no preservation without, you know, technically breaking copyright law. Companies don't, it's not in their commercial interest usually to fully preserve their histories. And that by nature of any work, I think it's going to be the community that, that does the, the legwork on that. And there is still a lot of work to do. The public thinks that everything has been already preserved. So that's the biggest issue. I think that we need to put the message out that there's a lot of versions and that there's a lot of things that need to be redumped so that we can confirm that what we have is right. Also, sometimes, not every time, but sometimes you get a version that's slightly different or in our arcade board, like the graphics are slightly different than the Japanese version, but nobody had noticed it because it worked with the Japanese graphics. So you have to read up everything, redocument it, and even if it's tedious, you, you have to try to do it properly each time. Whether it's used simply as a way to play for free, as a matter of convenience, or as a means of ensuring that history is not lost. Whatever is the right way to handle ROMs is something that each person must decide for themselves. Regardless of a person's feelings on copying game data, there are other areas of preservation that anyone might be able to contribute to. There are several things that might be in your collection that are not documented. And uh, it's not just the ROM dump, it's uh, also pictures, boxes, manuals, because there's much more information than just the game. You know, there's like economic information, you might tell uh, there was an economic exchange between Malaysia, Taiwan, and Japan because of the parts that came in certain eras. And that's, uh, that's interesting information for somebody in the future because they'll know there was this economic exchange and there was, there was these agreements back then and you have hard evidence to back it up, right? And, and that's information that would be lost otherwise. actual hardware that runs the games does not enjoy the same legal protections as the software. Thus, the tools that make it possible to back up games and play copies of games are often openly developed, distributed, and even sold commercially. 
Emulation was challenged in the court of law in the United States in the 90s, and the judge found no wrongdoing with emulating the PlayStation in the 90s. Clearly emulating systems. There's nothing illegal about reverse engineering hardware and re-implementing it. Emulation for video games is most often the imitation of hardware through software, such as running an emulator on a phone or PC to play games designed for other platforms. Software emulation in general has outstanding pros and cons, but outstanding pros if you have a budget to keep in mind. Being able to do save states is a huge upgrade, and I think that's where the draw is for a lot of people, especially with smaller emulator boxes like Raspberry Pi based ones, where they can just plug in and play some games. An NES Classic, a RetroPie fitted with an appropriate emulator and the ROMs that you like, you know, if you have no moral quandary against piracy, I mean, if you are on a budget, these are fantastic choices. Many game companies have embraced software emulation as a means of capitalizing on nostalgia, such as with game compilations, Nintendo's virtual console services, or miniature classic edition systems. For some, the idea of official emulation might seem more palatable than software developed by the gaming public. I think there's this weird misinterpretation that just because someone works at a company called Nintendo and has a business card that says Nintendo on it, that makes them somehow more qualified to emulate a Nintendo system. And I don't think that's true at all. I think that the collective communal knowledge that has come from open source emulation projects is like, I mean, frankly, like there's, there is no way that Nintendo wasn't looking at open source software to figure out how their old hardware worked. In addition to his work with the Video Game History Foundation, Frank Cifaldi has worked with Other Ocean Interactive under the Digital Eclipse brand to produce commercial releases that repackage older games, along with archives that tell their histories for new platforms. As a vocal advocate for the use of emulation in keeping classic games accessible, Frank champions the importance and validity of highly detailed open source emulators, such as the multi-system emulator Hegon, which is best known for its meticulous documentation of the Super Nintendo hardware. We could probably not pay someone enough money with our overhead costs as a business to like make a low level Super Nintendo emulator. That's just not a viable business. And if we were to do a Super Nintendo project, we would absolutely be licensing Hegon. Emulators like Hegon attempt to replicate all functions of a console as closely as possible, requiring a very close study of the original system silicon. But most emulators operate closer to the surface, using some degree of abstraction to present an interpretation of the expected result. You have many approaches. You're simulating the coexistence of different elements inside uh, the hardware. And you can take a low level approach or high level approach that's completely uh, arbitrary terms in general, because you can move that line between those two as much as you want. But a high level approach uh, means that you can use the hardware on the platform that you're using to emulate the other one to replicate certain functions and don't bother on how they work. In other words, you try to replicate the results, not the process. And that's cool. But the thing is, if you want to repair a PCV, you are concerned on how the process works because that's what you want to repair. But if you just want the result, then uh, you can just skip that and even improve upon that and have like a widescreen or other modes on top of that. And that's cool, but it's not oriented towards an implementation that does a replication of the process. For simply playing games, high level emulation is often favored over low level emulation due to the steep system requirements for keeping processes perfectly synced to the original hardware cycles and other computationally complex tasks. In practice, many emulators are a mixture of these methods, and what type of emulator a person uses comes down to a number of considerations. Do they need cycle perfect emulation or do they just need a good and super fast representation of the systems that they used to play 25 years ago? Often people think that cycle perfect means that it's going to be and play exactly the same on newer hardware. That ain't always the case. 
Even with the most accurate emulators, various hurdles still stand in the way for the average computer to be able to generate audio, output frames, and handle inputs at the same pace as the original hardware. You have your controller that's probably connected to a USB port. Well, a USB port has overhead and latency. You have a frame buffer that has to draw the screen for your cycle perfect emulator. That frame buffer is going to have a certain measurable amount of latency. And of course, there are other things such as the, the display that you're using and the screen refresh time. There's going to be latency involved there too. Every emulator is a balance of accuracy and performance, and in the case of low-level emulation in particular, the documentation of a console's functionality, as closely as can be determined to be true by the developers, may be the project's main priority rather than ease of use and playability. For many people, these footnotes are non-issues, and they do prefer the flexibility offered by software emulation while others may feel that emulation development is important for preservation, but is still not a perfect solution for playing in the here and now. I don't really love it because I like original hardware. I think, I think as computers progress and we break down more of these chips, that emulation will get very close. There's so many amazing things you could do with emulation that you could never do on original consoles. Whether it's um, rendering in a higher resolution, some of the newer projects like the wideness where you could actually look around the playable visible area and it's just so many amazing things that can be done. But once again, it's just however the target experience, whatever that goal is, is what people should be looking for. Many emulators offer features that help make the experience feel a bit more authentic, like advanced video shaders that mimic the look of vintage screens. And while latency is historically a concern for emulators, a feature dubbed Run Ahead can run multiple instances of a game to not only reduce input lag in emulation, but potentially surpass the original hardware in responsiveness. It is a theoretical solution that I think could be tuned for most games, uh, but it's not, I don't think a plug and play thing that works for absolutely everything magically. I think it is a viable approach for sure. The problem though is that you're running two emulator cores. That is eating up a lot of CPU. Software emulation is undoubtedly the most prevalent method used for playing classic games in the absence of the original hardware. But emulation can mean different things which leads to heated debates over whatever might be perceived as a superior method for playing games, and whether it is or is not emulation. People are hung up on the, the semantics of the word emulation. Pretty much every revision of the first console is, a, is an emulation of the, of the previous revision. I mean, it's different. Chips are different. I could do without some of the proselytizing around formats of play and methods of play. To me, the great thing about the, the sort of explosion of classic gaming and the, the viability of this as a segment of the video games industry is that there are lots of different options for playing a game, whether it's tracking down the original hardware and you know trying to get it to run, or some sort of modded device like the GBA consoleizer, or emulating it. Whatever works best for you, that's, that's the right choice for you. A clone console is a system designed to play games for a specific platform or platforms, but designed and sold by a company other than the original manufacturer, usually at a lower cost. Without access to the same chips as the official hardware, many clone consoles rely on application-specific integrated circuits, called an ASIC or system on a chip, which are designed to mimic the behavior of the originals closely enough to play the games but ASIC-based clone consoles in general have a somewhat poor reputation for not being engineered to very exacting standards. I mean, those nests on a chips is literally the same ones they were using 10 years ago, and they have the same bugs that they always have. Clone consoles are legal in part due to the expiration of hardware patents. Patent law covers an idea, a concept, a design for a certain number of years, 20 or so. And once that 
has expired, anyone can copy it. Clone consoles built with FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, have been widely hailed as the superior technology. Although technically there is no reason an ASIC couldn't be designed as well as good FPGA cores. The power of the FPGA is you can update it whenever you feel like instead of, you know, NES on a chip where if you get something wrong, you're stuck with it. FPGAs are mass manufactured circuits that can be integrated into almost any type of hardware project imaginable. Rather than a fixed design, the logic blocks of an FPGA can be configured by any end user to create something like a completely original CPU architecture. Alternatively, a hardware designer could also use an FPGA to integrate multiple components of a pre-existing system, CPU, graphics, and sound into a single FPGA, provided enough logic blocks are available. Each set of blocks performing one of those functions, such as a replicated picture processing unit, is called a core. This is how Kevin Horton designed many of the products from boutique console manufacturer Analog, including the NT Mini, the Super NT, and the Mega SG. While FPGA consoles are often touted as not emulation, these claims are highly contentious. It's often preferred that a hardware-based replication, such as an FPGA system, be referred to as hardware emulation in contrast to software emulation. Just like a software emulator, those cores can be buggy, so an FPGA doesn't immediately mean better, it just means it could be better. So on an FPGA, you can do things in parallel. On a software emulator, you must be sequential. So you need to design your, your approach with that in mind. It's, it's not one is better than the other or one is worse than the other. There are simply different approaches with different tools that will help you out in different ways. And you have different mindsets to use each one of them. Software emulation cores are often written with limited knowledge as to what type of computer it might run on how powerful it is, and what resources might be occupied with other tasks. FPGA cores, on the other hand, are typically designed for a predictable processing environment, free of any software other than the game itself, which should run the same way every time. A Super NT is a thing that plays Super Nintendo games, right? So like, there's no operating system overhead. The controller inputs, you know, there's none of the inherent delay that would be present in like a PlayStation 4 is just a monster for input delay. That said, I think that a theoretical emulator box for a software emulation approach can get it so close that most people won't notice. A software emulator can do as good as an FPGA emulator given you have enough power, right? Or, or vice versa. It needs to be something where people don't care if there's an FPGA inside. They don't need to know about the technology inside, it just needs to work. While there are systems that run on software emulation and accept original cartridges, they must first dump the ROM to play the game. One advantage of this is that game progress could be saved to the system without the need for a functioning SRAM battery. But for people of a certain mindset, there may be an appeal to the hardware-based nature of FPGA systems, making it possible for them to interact with a game in the same way as original hardware by directly addressing the cartridge during gameplay. So that's the first console board. Brian Parker is the creator of the AVS, an FPGA console designed to interface with Famicom and NES game cartridges and controllers which makes it a mostly seamless replacement for the original consoles, but equipped with HDMI output. The AVS, that was my dream hardware since, I mean, since I was a kid, we thought, you know, we're gonna make our own games, make our own console and sell it to Nintendo. I was getting a chance to play more NES games and just realizing how terrible they looked on a modern screen. So I was looking for a video upgrade and I had the skills to do it. So like getting something, any graphics to appear on screen, that was pretty quick. Getting the first game to run, I did Donkey Kong first. And that was relatively quick. 
But then after that, going through the hundred mappers and thousand games, that took a long time just to squish little bugs. Taking advantage of the AVS's no lag controller inputs, Brian also released his own wireless NES controllers. So now I can play a game I wrote on a system that I made using a controller I made. I got the AVS and the first thing I did is I took a screwdriver to it and popped it open. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is a lot of the same stuff I would have put in if I was building this. I'm not saying like I'm the greatest person ever and stuff like that. I just, I know that they have good fundamentals and good engineering disciplines to be able to build stuff like that. While NES consoles are aging, it's still not difficult to find one that works. It's impossible to be sure if hardware emulation systems will last even longer, but many FPGA enthusiasts are betting on that being the case. You've reset the clock, and also with the FPGA systems, you can take that FPGA source and bring it to whatever is the next version of that FPGA. While the AVS was among the first FPGA consoles, it was preceded by the one-chip MSX and a multi-platform hardware emulation device called the MIST FPGA computer, which the MISTER project later branched from, running on more accessible, more up-to-date hardware than MIST. In 2018, the popularity of MISTER began to grow exponentially as it caught the attention of prominent game preservation community members such as Smoke Monster, who gave it wider exposure. Depending on how you approach MISTER, it can be really complex or it can be really easy. So I sort of try to make it easy for people. Rather than using an original board design, the MISTER is built around a general purpose board by Terrasic called the DE10 Nano, which incorporates an Altera Cyclone 5 FPGA. Community members develop and contribute cores for a wide range of platforms to the project, which, along with ROM files, can be loaded from a micro SD card. It has a way to go before it's just something for everyone. Right now, it's extremely technical, so it's, it's very much a like a tinkerer, hobbyist sort of project that you have to be really serious about. Mister is managed as an open source project by Alexei Melnikov who requires cores to be open sourced in order to be officially supported. The idea is that Mr. Cores will continue to be improved and iterated upon and be easily portable to future FPGA hardware. Once something's captured in FPGA, it's permanent if it's open source because it'll, it can go on to Mr. 10 years from now or any other projects. It can be pulled out of Mr. and made into a standalone device. The MISTER's flexible nature that allows it to replicate famous systems like the Atari 2600, Game Boy, and Sega Genesis also gives it the ability to mimic arcade hardware and more obscure platforms, which has given hope to those who want to preserve games for play in a hardware environment, especially since, in addition to HDMI, MISTER can use analog output to aid in producing an error-appropriate viewing experience on a CRT display. It's a museum in your house, so you can go all the way back to like 1959 uh, PDP-1, a really old supercomputer that you couldn't fit in your house that can run the first video game ever, Space Wars, depending on who you ask. We have a cycle accurate core of that in MISTER, and we also have Neo Geo where you can play Metal Slug 5, so it's a big span of time right now. And I think people who will get into Mr. who come from the console world will have their eyes open by some of these classic computers, like especially MSX and Amiga. I think as the Mr. evolves, we'll start to see projects evolve out of it that are, you know, much more consumer friendly, much more sort of casual plug and play. You know, like the, the mini console trend, I could see like five years from now, those being based on FPGAs. FPGAs are still very much specialist items, but that's not always going to be the case. Regardless of whether the emulation is produced through software or hardware, there is one major snag that makes legal replication of many platforms extremely difficult. Things become more complicated when you get to something like the PlayStation and the later eras where you have uh, system BIOS files that are required to make the, the hardware run. That's protected by copyright, which lasts much longer than patents. So then you have to reverse 
engineer the BIOS, and that's much more difficult. Since emulator authors cannot distribute official BIOS files without risking legal action, projects like the PCSX2 PlayStation 2 emulator encourage the user to dump their own BIOS file from their personal PS2 console using homebrew tools, even if, realistically, very few people will actually do so. With hardware emulation, people can play games in the absence of original hardware. And with something like Mr. or software emulation, games can be played both without the original hardware and without a physical game. But how could games be played on original hardware or hardware clones without access to an actual cartridge or disc? Brian Parker is a pioneer in yet another area of vintage game hardware, the flash cartridge. He released the Power Pack in 2007, the first cartridge sold for the Nintendo Entertainment System that could load ROM files from Flash Media. This was actually before SD cards were common, so everything was using Compact Flash or MMC cards, which basically don't exist anymore. Flash cartridges such as the Power Pack and the EverDrive series by Igor Golubovsky have become extremely popular in the vintage gaming scene for those who prefer to play on hardware. It was pretty slow to get started because at that time people were still thinking original carts, but as carts have gotten more expensive, then flash carts have become more popular. And it's also been a very large thing for homebrewer development where they can run their code on original systems. Flash cartridges with more powerful FPGAs like the FX Pack Pro for SNES can also mimic cartridge expansion hardware like the Super FX and SA1 chips. Not only can it run the games that normally use that hardware, but it also opens up the possibility for adapting other games to tap into their power, such as the work done by Vitor Valela in reducing slowdown in certain titles. In addition, flash cartridge FPGAs could also be used to create expansion hardware that did not originally exist, such as MSU-1, which can be used to integrate streaming data into cartridge games. <laughs> Obviously, there's a piracy component to this, right? But I think we're also talking about preservation in a lot of respects. A lot of these games are 25, 30 years old. They've been on the secondary market for 25 or 30 years. Uh, these publishers haven't uh, retooled them for newer systems, and there's no other way to enjoy them often. I have no problems with flashcards, and I have no problems with optical drive emulators. I think they're super important. An optical drive emulator, often shortened to ODE, is a media launcher for consoles that use optical drives instead of cartridges. This can take the form of a literal physical replacement of the original broken drive, or is a cartridge that interfaces with the system in another way to load copies of disc-based games from Flash Media to platforms such as TurboGrafx CD, Sega CD, Sega Saturn, PlayStation, and Dreamcast. I like optical drive emulators more than flashcards, mainly because, again, the mechanical failure, and that seems like the only real way to preserve the future of consoles that use optical drives. That was easy. A more complex concern is preserving arcade games. 
While many arcade boards can be played independent of a traditional arcade cabinet with a device such as a super gun, it's a technically difficult and exceptionally expensive hobby. Oftentimes, an arcade board is a unique computer built for no purpose other than to play one specific game. All of this arcade hardware that we're still trying to enjoy was made not even in a fraction of the amount of volume that we have, you know, copies of Mega Man 2 and copies of Super Mario Bros. 3. You know, oftentimes this arcade hardware was hand assembled and it was sent out to, oh, rather than being sent out to every single home in the United States, it was sent out to a couple of pizza joints. When I say a couple, maybe I mean a few hundred, maybe a few thousand, but the point is, it's the volume. There are several pieces that have already been lost. I got this uh, Saturday Night Slam Masters in Mexico and uh, I opened it up and they had already converted it to the US version and the Mexican version was undocumented. And it's a very rare PCB, not because it's expensive, it's simply they convert that to other versions for business purposes. So uh, that, that couldn't be documented. And I had it like right in front of my eyes, the stickers were there that it was the, the Hispanic version, but that's, that's gone. Replicating an arcade game experience goes far beyond ROM dumping. An analysis of the idiosyncrasies of each board is also required. This is where the MAME project comes in. MAME is a documentation process. It's not, it's not an emulator for playing. It's never intended for that. That's just a side effect. And it's a viral effect to help people help preserve it as a community. MAME is an emulator that plays arcade ROMs, whatever, but really the MAME project is all about documenting these boards and making sure that we understand them in the future, you know? It's like, here's how the ROMs work, how they talk to each other. And that's just invaluable in terms of historical preservation. And main tries to be that for every console, every arcade PCB, and every computer out there, and every pinball, and every mechanically attraction that's been out there that we can try to dump and document. There's no way that work would have been done without the open source community doing the labor on it because it's just not commercially viable to, you know, reverse engineer all of these arcade boards from scratch for like an arcade collection or whatever. And now MAME essentially has laid the groundwork for MISTER because all of the MISTER arcade cores, for example, use the same MAME ROM data just laid out with different logic kind of to make its magic. Emulation has come a long way since the 90s, but work is still being done to better understand video game hardware down to the most minute details so that its true essence can be carried into the future. The notion that emulation has been perfect for the past 15 years, I think in a lot of ways is just erroneous and silly to say. Turbo graphics and PC engine systems generate both YUV and RGB palettes internally with some colors appearing very different between the two. But only YUV was officially supported via RF and composite connections. Some shades may even appear as though they're missing when using RGB, which is the color space used by RGB console mods, RGB output adapters, and emulators. Emulation for NES has taken YUV to RGB conversion into account since nearly the beginning, but it was largely ignored that the PC Engine required similar considerations until 2020, when a team spent months converting the system's YUV values into a new RGB palette. Even then, the result was sluggishly adopted outside of Mister. A preservationist must then wonder what else has been overlooked. One aspect that has been especially difficult for emulator developers to replicate, whether in software or hardware, is the precise audio signatures produced by various systems. Each console has different procedures, filters, to attenuate or accentuate specific frequencies, specific ranges, like the bass or treble, and each one of those could vary by model. 
So it's not like there's a specific signature for a, a Genesis. There are several signatures depending on the era that it was built. Feeling dissatisfied with the lack of scientific methodology in video game audio analysis, Artemio Urbina decided to do something about it himself. I like having the capacity to measure reality to understand it, right? So I thought, well, why don't we do something that can tell us without subjective uh, interpretation how these signals differ? So I decided to write that, and well, that was the beginning of MD Fourier. MD Fourier is an audio tool that Artemio has integrated into the 240p test suite software for certain platforms. It generates tones that can be recorded and compared against a target recording on a computer for analysis, revealing how the implementations differ which can help in adjusting a software or hardware emulator to more closely match the desired audio signature. There's always been uh, information on the internet that tells you, no, this is the best sounding, but best is a very relative term. Best means that's the best for me, I like it. And, and that's cool. But the thing is now you can say, I like this specific audio signature and could try to replicate it. Or you can tell, okay, I like this specific audio signature, but this other console has exact same data. So I was just like biased by saying that on version six was different to on version three. They are the same thing, almost the same thing, but now you can measure them. MD Fourier has been used to generate more authentic audio for mods, Mr. Cores, and even devices like the Mega SD and Mega EverDrive Pro. Flash cartridges for the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive that can emulate the Sega CD hardware. But it is important to remember that just because MD Fourier was used to adjust audio on any given project, that doesn't necessarily mean total accuracy has been attained. So those who may be using replicated hardware for producing music or recording archival quality audio may want to run their own MD Fourier analysis to verify the claims or inform a direction for their own adjustments. MD Fourier is one of many tools that can aid in the ongoing efforts to document gaming hardware as thoroughly as possible. But where does the process of reverse engineering begin? Accurate emulation, whether as hardware or software, requires an objective analysis of what is actually occurring inside the original system and how the chips work together. You assume a black box and it has inputs and outputs and you exercise those in certain ways to duplicate them and find out everything you can about it. And of course, there's gonna be corner cases where you didn't try that specific input-output combination. Even if all the data used by every known existing game passes correctly with no bugs, it's difficult to be sure if all possible data would behave the same. There's almost an infinite amount of data you can put in, and you know, just like any game, you know, they're only gonna use a small, a small amount. Obviously, it's better to have the original documentation, but you can get pretty darn close. It's all in the time and the detail. But even with documentation, some skepticism may be necessary. For example, uh, Hotego, that's a, a really talented programmer, does his implementations with a PCV, tries to recreate everything, goes to the schematics, even finds errors in the schematics, because the, the PCV that he has in front of him is, does not correspond to the, to the schematic he has. Uh, he found a bug in, in, in some games that were in MAME, but the PCB didn't have that bug, right? And uh, we, we tried to report that back to MAME and, and fix that. Another reverse engineering method involves decapping the individual chips. 
that's opening them up and, and scanning them with microscopes and figuring out how the, the silicon layers interact with each other and create a replication based on that. And that's just been happening for a few years now. Team Europe does a lot of things for MAME and also caps off, it's called. They do amazing work decapping stuff. It's really interesting and exciting watching how they narrate, how they recover the information from these pieces. There's also the work by Fortech. Fortech has done an amazing job documenting the new Geo hardware, reverse engineering, re-implementing parts, and also open sourcing everything and giving back uh, ways to repair hardware and at the same time to implement that on an FPGA. That's the ideal approach. This may seem like a more direct route to obtain information about a chip compared to a black box approach, but it is considered to be significantly more difficult, costly, and time consuming using existing techniques, which involve lasers, acids, specialized microscopes, and knowledge of how the chip is designed to function. Instead of a holistic approach, it's, a, it's, a, it's an analysis of the minimalistic parts of, of, of each element, recreate all those and construct the, the giant beast. So that's the difference. If you go to a black box solution, you are replicating the results. If you are going to a decap solution, you are replicating the process. Both things might get you the same result for an end user, but they are very different in how they work. And in the preservation standpoint, they are also very different in what they offer. Until someone actually decaps all these chips and gets them gate for gate, that's gonna be the only way that we're gonna have perfect emulation. In addition to the hardware, individual pieces of game software can also be reverse engineered with methods such as decompilation, allowing for the development of new source code that could be used to port the game to current platforms. The work that we're doing to better understand this hardware and how it works is ultimately leading us toward the history of video games being as accessible on any device as films are now. Frank Cifaldi points to RetroArch, a front-end for managing emulators for multiple platforms, as a model for how classic games might be officially presented with a service similar to Netflix or Amazon Prime Video. RetroArch is that, but in a non-commercial form, where it's like it's built in a smart way where it's easily portable and it's, you know, it's probably always going to be around as, as hardware evolves. And I just hope to see the commercial version of that someday because while I don't really care if people like download these games on their own and play them, great, cool, I, I do it myself. But I think that there's a lot to be said about games being commercially available in the sense that we preserve them in the collective mindshare. ROMs on the internet will only go so far with word of mouth or whatever, but if a company is you know, embracing their back catalog and bringing it back in print, then I think that preserves its legacy in a way that that having to pirate it doesn't. But even legal distribution comes with its own pitfalls. The more time that passes, the harder it is to clear up the licensing for a lot of these old games. You know, people go missing that might have a cut of these games and it's like, I'm not gonna sell this game if I can't find the composer that for life gets a 2% cut of it. And so we need to figure out emulation fast while we can still clear up the licensing for these games. Even with big companies like where they've lost so much of their history, maybe it's from paperwork that they've just thrown out or games that they don't have anymore, especially unreleased stuff. If we didn't have collectors going after that stuff, then it wouldn't exist anymore. But then I find myself at my own company not preserving stuff that I probably should. So I can kind of understand where the big companies are at. Many community, nonprofit, and commercial efforts have extended the reach and accessibility of older games for the people of today, but may not meet everyone's definition of preservation. For instance, should a commercial product, such as an FPGA console or a classic game compilation, be considered preservation? I'm not sure if that would be preservation or just keeping the interest around which leads to the preservation side of it. You can have something closed source and still have preservation. It's more like, do they stop producing it and then abandon the project and then it's gone? 
I think some people get upset when things aren't open source. And as long as that's the end game, as long as uh, you know there's an eventual release to the public, I think that's incredible and I really applaud people to do that. All of the enthusiasm about Mr. feeds from our enthusiasm about these closed source products, especially like the NT Mini. It was my first exposure to FPGA stuff. And now all of these different flashcard devices that use FPGAs. What they do is they raise the interest in an open source project like Mr. And they also bring in developers. I think I have a pretty liberal definition of preservation. I think preservation is, you know, just the, the act of making sure that an idea doesn't disappear from the world. And closed source emulation is, of course, a way of doing that. Like, it, it's a way of making software accessible, even if you can't go in and port that software to another platform or whatever. It's still a way of making the stuff accessible to researchers and, or just fans or whatever. And that's absolutely, yeah, that's a form of preservation. Well, that was a double. Three, two, one, let's go. All of the work done today may be useful to the future of preservation in unexpected ways. Projects that appear to be finished may take new forms decades or even centuries later. As long as the knowledge and understanding of the original hardware and software and the context and culture that surrounds them is not lost, future generations will make of it what they will. I think that preservation should be blind to preferences, to mainstream trends. It should just preserve anything because you don't know the importance in the future that it's going to have. So you can't pretend to tell what thing should be preserved and which one wouldn't. I don't think there is an end game. I think we're going to constantly adapt you're always going to always have to interface legacy technology with new technology. It just happens with any other field too. It's not just with retro gaming. How long will USB cables be around? You don't know that, right? So things seem to be ubiquitous, just like BHA tapes were, were just accessible, floppies were just accessible in the, the store at the corner. Just tell me how easy it is to grab an MMC card or an SD card that's less than two gigabytes today. Is it easy? And uh, will it be easy to grab something that will be compatible with, with current hardware implementations? We don't know. In another 20, 40 years, you're going to see the same thing where TVs are going to start dropping HDMI for whatever's next. And someone will have to come along and have a new system. I mean, we think the, the original Game Boy work is big, but this is just like a giant book. The work of preservation will never be finished. Some things will slip through the cracks, but as long as the original hardware and materials exist, they will be referenced and documented for people's benefit now and in the future. After that, it's up to the following generations to maintain that information for new implementations. Needs food. Needs food as for just playing the games, the big picture goals of preservation might give some sobering perspective on the petty squabbles that arise over the best way to play old games. A preservationist's goal is different from someone whose goal is simply to consume the game and start the process of enjoying the game. In the end, it's up to what do you think the best thing is, right? And that answer is personal. You have a set of priorities, necessities, interests, and uh, uh, I don't know, budget. And those things decide for you what's the best approach. The players of today can enjoy most of their favorite games from childhood or discover classics that they missed in such a wide multitude of ways, regardless of whether they have access to the original hardware. No matter what their intended purpose or perceived quality, all of these methods serve to keep both researchers and the gaming public informed of and interested in the history of video games and looking forward to the next innovation.